21st century megaport, handling ships of every shape and size. Everybody's rush, rush, rush. Rush, thank you. Ship has to fail by five. Thousands of people. Park over there. Operating one of the most complicated collections of heavy equipment on the planet. About to get hit here. All must work in perfect harmony. Somebody go! Or the smallest problem. You got some luggage coming at us? Will turn into a global headache. It's really important that we get out on time. To stay afloat around here, you must be industrious. Vancouver is the end of the line for thousands of miles of road, rail, and pipelines. It's the last North American stop before Asia. If there is a problem in this complicated network that slows the flow of cargo, the ripple effects will be felt around the world. The port is made up of 28 terminals, covering 400 miles of shoreline, employing 40,000 people. And it's about to be a very busy day. At the coal terminal, two vessels are already at the dock. Downtown, they are getting ready for a container ship and two cruise ships that should arrive over the next few hours. Down on the river, they're loading a log ship and waiting for an auto carrier to arrive with a full load of brand new cars. Like most deep water ports, it was here before the city. The chief architect is Mother Nature, creating the perfect conditions for a port. Steep mountains plunging into the ocean allows ships to tie up close to shore without hitting bottom. With 4,000 ships cruising in and out of the port every year, knowing who goes where and when is a big job that starts the with the equivalent of an airport control tower. Defender, Roger. The maritime controllers have a bird's eye view of the main protected harbor. And what they can't see through their windows, they monitor with dozens of cameras and radar stations that cover every inch of the port. Comox, Crown, Vancouver. Vancouver, Before a ship can enter the control zone, they must first contact the control tower by radio. Norwegian Sun Bank, traffic Roger. The vessels are guided to parking spots in the middle of the harbor until a terminal is ready for them. The Norwegian Sun is off Brandy Shoal. But for most ships, the goal is to get in and out of port as quickly as possible, avoiding the parking lot and heading straight to the terminals. For the past two weeks, the Yang Ming South has pounded her way across the North Pacific. On board, Asian-made goods. Roger, thank you. Everything from kitchen sinks Sorry, to car stereos, all packed into the 1,700 containers. Twice a month, this ship crosses the Pacific. When it arrives on this trip just off of North America, it's the middle of the night and the start of the most dangerous part of its journey. Go around now and uh, stop engines for boarding, please. Okay, I The coast here is a navigator's nightmare. Rocks, shoals, and vicious currents. Safety first. To help keep the Yang Ming South safe, local navigation pilot Larry Wilson is sent aboard. He must transfer from a pilot vessel to a four-story tall rope ladder. A slip up here could cost him his life. Worldwide, over the past three years, 
There have been over a dozen pilots killed by falling off the pilot ladder. The Yangmeng South has survived wicked Pacific storms that threatened to knock her off schedule. It's now up to Larry to make sure she survives the last leg of her voyage. The ship will be uh, approaching First Narrows at 5.15, and we'll have 1.4 knots of flood tide behind us. Starboard 20. Family type, 090. Alpha head, please. Starboard 20. So the challenge now is to get her slowed down. We're doing almost nine knots with a tide behind us. We've got 45,000 tons of ship. Stop engine. We're uh, just about a half a mile from the dock. Under the bridge, they still need to get to the terminal. Sun Spirit of the 8, let's switch down to 15. About 15. Spirit 15. Tugs at either end ease her into the dock. Spirit has. A little white mark on the dock, this side of the containers. That's our uh, bridge mark. Basically, a parking spot that will allow cranes and big equipment to access the containers. If we get too close, let me know. Uh, Bridge is going between the 240 and 250 mark. Stop, 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 engine. Stop. Two weeks, eight hours, and 27 minutes after leaving Asia, the Yangming South is secured. We call containers cans. On this ship, there's probably 3,000 cans total if it's fully loaded. The ship is now in the hands of the container terminal's Kerry Liggy. There's huge consequences if we don't do the job that we're supposed to do. And our responsibility is to get it out within the time that we have allotted to get it onto its next port of call. With just eight hours to move 340 containers off the ship and load 200 new cans, the terminal must run with precision. And so as far as we're concerned, we can be able to handle that cargo? Yeah. The movement of each container is coordinated in the central control room. These guys are the guys that are watching the day-to-day -day operations. They've got the technology that monitors everything that we're doing out there. The stars of the show are the three gantry cranes, each more than 10 stories tall. Their long arms can reach across the widest ships in the world. Forward touch it. For the crane operators, success is measured in moves per four-hour shift. Each one of these containers can weigh as much as 50 tons and could be worth millions of dollars. To make the departure deadline, each crane has less than a minute per container to lift, swing, and drop. 540 moves are planned for the Yang Ming South today. But there is already a potential problem. The weather forecast at the port is calling for high winds. The sirens will go off and it'll start beeping when the wind gust goes over, you know, 35 miles an hour. Too much wind could send the container swinging, or worse, spinning, making it impossible to lift and lower onto the trucks. If the wind gets any stronger, the terminal will shut down, a delay that will cost big time and big money. Can I make 21 seconds for traffic, go ahead. That's morning traffic, small bars and curves. Meanwhile, several miles south, the maritime controllers have just closed a section of river. A giant log barge is leaning heavily to one side. It looks serious. But around here, looks can be deceiving. All right. This is actually a good thing. Whenever you're ready. In fact, the self-unloading log barge is about to knock 12 hours off the loading process of the MV Kenzui. It's a fair bit of boredom and preparation, followed by seconds of, of terror. Tanks on one side of the barge are filling up with water, causing it to list. Uh, it's going to go pretty fast. Eventually, the logs will let go and spill into the water. That was a good one. The barge ran over pretty far. 
Another great day at the port. With the load in the water, small tugs start moving logs around, sorting them by size and type. Yeah, once the logs hit the water, they're bundled up, they're bagged in a boom, and then the uh, tug company brings them uh, down alongside the ship. Look over this way. It's up to Scott Petrie to make sure the ship is loaded correctly. Hey, Gary, it's moving up a bit on the tour ship. The customer in Japan wants only certain sizes and certain species of logs. So it's level. OK, pull up a little bit. I'm about to get hit here. There we go. Oh, we're OK. That's OK, Gary, you missed me. <laughs> If this looks dangerous, it is. Now you can crush somebody really easily, right? Each one of those bundles swinging through the air weighs as much as a rail car. Keep going. If one of the cables lets go, the logs will spill everywhere. You're OK, Gary. Scott can't afford to waste time, but he can't afford to rush and put lives in danger. Back downtown, a half dozen ships are parked and waiting to dock. A cruise ship is heading to its terminal, and the Yangming South is already well into its day at the container terminal. Earlier, wind was threatening to shut down the loading, but for now, the cranes are still swinging. The wind speeds have dropped off, and the pace on the dock has been cranked up. The giant cranes are moved on rails up the terminal to reach new stacks of containers. And just when things look like they are running perfectly, we got a whole track of coming in. Got Carrie is container. about to get hit to with a new problem. All we have is CN cargo on, on site, and we got to get it on the rail. The railway is supposed to send a new train here every four hours. But this morning, a problem on the line means those cars didn't show up. Kerry must now scramble to keep up. If that rail car doesn't get to us in time, we can't load it to the ship. And the same responsibility applies to us. If we don't get that container off that ship and onto that rail car, that could mean that that container doesn't get to its destination when it's required in terms of the time. The ship's departure time is in jeopardy. The captain may now face a tough choice. Wait for the missing cargo or leave without it. At the container terminal, half the load is off the ship. Strong winds that could have shut the terminal down are no longer an issue. But a new problem has cropped up. The Yangming South has been in port now for almost six hours. It's scheduled to leave in two hours. Cargo has been arriving by truck all afternoon. But a problem on the main rail link into the port has choked off train traffic. And then we just ran out of cargo. The crew at the terminal is worried. Containers bound for the Yangming South may be stuck on a rail siding somewhere. Malfunction with the railway's uh, engine off-site here. It could delay the ship's departure. But when the crew checks the loading plan, they catch a lucky break. None of the containers on the broken down train were bound for the Yangming. The ship in tomorrow does need those containers. Carrie hey has a little breathing room, but he still needs that train problem fixed fast. So I'm looking at 2030 finish and sailing at 2100. OK. When the departure time does roll around, the Yang Ming is still at the dock. The gantry cranes are still going strong, but Carrie isn't upset. The ship's captain has been asked if he wants to take on some extra last minute cargo a process that should take about four hours. It's not uncommon for us to have a situation where the customer has an opportunity to load extra cargo. Extra cargo is extra revenue for them. It's extra revenue for us. Back at the logging terminal, the money man is Paul Gallant. Yeah, 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 OK. He's also trying to squeeze as much cargo on his ship as possible. I'll talk to the mate, yeah. Wasted space on a vessel is wasted money. As the eyes and ears of the Asian company he's delivering to 
If there's a problem or a delay, Paul needs to know about it. The customer expects us to get it in and out as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Keeping the logs moving quickly from the river to one of the ship's five holds will keep the MV Kenzui on schedule. That's good! It all hinges on the crane operator. The crane driver can't see down to the water side. I have to take my signals from uh, my foreman. It makes it real difficult sometimes. And then when it comes into the hatch, the hatch foreman takes over and stows the cargo. So he'll actually uh, tell the crane driver where to put it and uh, signal to him how to put it in the hatch. Once in the ship, bundles need to be released. And the load needs to settle. Go down the hatch with the ratchet cutters. And we cut every band. The holds are filling up, but the MV Kenzui isn't even close to being fully loaded. Close the hatch covers and then we go on top. And these lids here will close down and then they raise these collapsible stanches here so they act as a wall for the uh, on deck cargo and then we'll go right up, right up to the bottom of the crane. The shipping company wants to take as much cargo as possible so nearly half the load will be stacked on deck. Keep going, keep going, get it! Ah, perfect! This is not an exact science. No two loads are the same. This is where experience comes in. You know, we're starting to get a port list. Yeah. Too top heavy, and the ship could capsize at sea. Paul needs to be ready to fix any problems fast. Come on, boys. Keep pulling the slack up. Let's go. The MV Kenzui is nearly ready to sail. One more, Tony. Then come on, get the lashing bar. You gotta get that up your head. The crew has managed to squeeze on a pretty big load, but before she can leave the dock, the ship must get approval from the Coast Guard. So one and two are fully lashed with chain and everything. They're starting the catwalk in the forward. And you can see they're just pulling the foot wires here on three hatch. So. Unless I find the ship safe, I will not let her sail. It's kind of stressful for me right now because I'm worried about getting the ship out on time. We got another one coming in right behind it. If the Coast Guard doesn't approve the way the ship has been loaded, logs will need to be removed. It's just something I don't even want to contemplate. Back. Ready to go? OK. Anytime, Tim. The Coast Guard will check stability of the ship with something called a roll test. Get it rocking. An onboard crane lowers a bundle of logs over the side of the vessel to start rocking it. The inspector measures how much time it takes for the vessel to stabilize. What it's supposed to replicate is the open seas. For the entire load crew, a week's worth of work boils down to a test of less than half a minute. What'd you get? Uh, 20, uh, 24. 24? Uh, yeah, yeah. The Coast Guard must now calculate if 24 seconds is safe. For the crew, the next few minutes will feel like ours. Just up from the logging terminal, where they have packed every corner of this Japan-bound ship, a new vessel from Asia has just been cleared into port. I think you're loud, Claire. This is the Planet Ace. At five stories tall and longer than two football fields, this is one of the most specialized ships in port this year. She is basically a floating parking garage, packed full of shiny new Japanese cars. It kicked into high gear 12 days ago when it left Japan. Today, they start unloading 3,000 cars. All right, we got a job today. We got 300 cars up there, one bus. This is the closest port to Asia. So it's the first stop on a route that will take it up and down the Pacific coast. Last year, this terminal put through 243,000 new automobiles. 
So far, so good. This is a roll, roll ship. It's a roll on, roll off. Basically carries things with wheels. Keep the speed down on the ship and the dock. We're only bottoming out in the uh, accidents. So uh, let's go and have a safe discharge. Each of the five decks on the Planet Ace are packed door to door, bumper to bumper. The crossing to North America can be rough. Each car must be tied down tight to keep it from sliding and bumping into other vehicles. There's little hooks under the car, and they lash it down so when it's at sea, it doesn't move. The white suits are so they don't, uh, like if they have belt buckles on, they don't scratch the cars. This is the crack to make sure he turns out that way, not this way into the car. With this many cars and very little road, it helps to have a traffic cop. Jamie Zanetti is in charge of making sure nothing gets bent or scratched. And we're here to make sure they do it quickly but efficiently without any damage. Over the next two hours, they must get 300 cars off the ship. Another ship with another load of cars is waiting to dock so the port can't afford a traffic jam. When we have delays at the terminal, it can be very expensive. A ship being delayed is at least $25,000 a day to the owners, and obviously they don't like that. <laughs> the key to staying on schedule is these guys. Over here, boys. The Ports Factory Rally Team, a dozen guys that like to drive fast. The cars must move through a labyrinth inside the ship. Down the ramp. And into a parking lot. That's how it's done. A waiting van takes the drivers back to the ship to do it all over again. To keep their numbers up, each driver must move 15 cars an hour. Yes, we're done up top. Some of the cars are sent across the parking lot directly to the on-site detailing shop, where changes are made to meet special orders. Shrimp shop, we call it our accessory shop, where it gets accessories from audio to running boards to spoilers to floor mats. Each of us is expected to install 50 car audio systems a day. As the detailing work is progressing, rail cars and tractor trailers are arriving at the terminal to move the cars to dealerships across the country. What we'd like to see is vehicles come in, have a destination, we can load them very quickly. That gives us new ground space so that we can bring in more vehicles again. Back at the ship, the offload is about half complete, but the crew has just spotted a problem. A falling tide means the water levels in the port have dropped. The ship is sitting lower at the dock, and the car ramp is now dangerously close to hanging up on a steel bullard. What we don't want is the, uh, the ramp to hit this part here, the bollard, because then it'll screw up the ramp and we'll have to stop the operation while we fix it. Jamie needs to turn up the speed to try to outrun the falling tide. Close the door, Mark. Somebody go. Of all the ships in port today, the MV Kenzui has been here the longest, five days. She's supposed to leave tonight. The final hurdle is a Coast Guard inspection and roll test to check stability. Get it rocking. The ship was rocked from side to side. The Coast Guard timed how long it took to stabilize. What'd you get? If the ship fails the test, some cargo will be removed, costing the ship its departure time. So it would at least be another day and certainly more labor. 
by her calculation she was yeah. so she passed. So, so basically they're right on the calculation. Yeah. In fact, slightly better. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Was a good job. Okay. He approved the stability and uh, we're good to go. Paul couldn't be happier. As soon as he can, he will send the ship on her way. We are in hard over the lockdown. The maritime controllers have another vessel waiting at anchor, ready to do this all over again. But over at the auto terminal, the race is still on with Mother Nature, as they rush to get a load of brand new cars to shore. The port of Vancouver is firing on all cylinders. 28 terminals are open today, dealing with dozens of ships, carrying everything from cruise passengers to containers to logs. At the auto terminal, where a majority of the nation's Asian cars are unloaded, the Planet Ace is in a race against the tides. A falling tide has threatened to stop the offloading of hundreds of new cars, and the ramp is now dangerously close to striking a dock bullard that threatens to tip the ramp potentially damaging it. The crew of drivers has just been told to step on it. Have to give direction all the time. And by shifting the offload into high gear, they seem to be staying ahead of that tide. What happened is with the tide going out and the tide dropping, but we're discharging cars at the same time, so the weight is coming off of the ship as the cars are coming off. That raises that up and we've made it. But Jamie's job doesn't finish until he ensures that the vessel's giant door is safely closed. Stand by for logging. With the door securely locked, Jamie's job is done, at least until the next auto carrier arrives. It's gonna sail, come back another day. The DNA from just about every Japanese automobile can be traced directly back to this port and these giant black piles at one of the largest coal terminals in the world. This is some of the finest metallurgical coal on the planet, the main ingredient for Japanese auto steel. Each one of these coal cars produces 320 vehicles. Two ships are docked. The first job is to get the coal out of the rail cars and into the terminal system. This is called the rotary dumper. Giant claws grasp each car and turn it upside down, with the coal spilling onto a conveyor belt five stories below. Each loaded car weighs 30 tons. The dumper can flip 60 cars an hour. Now, it's either earmarked for the stockpile, or if we're lucky, in about 30 to 40% of the time we are, it goes directly to the ship. We call that a direct hit. If they can't make a direct hit onto a waiting ship, the coal is sent into the yard and onto giant piles. Each one of these piles is a different type of coal. It comes from different mines. Each factory has its own secret steel recipe. It's up to the coal terminal to mix and match the different coal piles to fill each exact order. The piles tower five stories high. They've been created by this machine. It's a stack of reclaimer. It can move about 3,500 tons of coal in an hour. Conveyor belts lead from the rotary dumper to the top of the stacker. From there, it's a short flight to the top of the piles. When the piles are ready to be shipped, the stacker converts into a reclaimer. A giant wheel with buckets on it rips into the pile. In an eight-hour shift uh, with this machine, if you reclaim 20,000 ton, which is the equivalent of about two whole train loads, that would be a good day. On a 
first started on the waterfront, we used to carry the sacks around by hand, and here we are now loading 4,000 tons uh, an hour. An operation this big needs to be coordinated. Every machine, every belt can be started and stopped from the control room. I put the wrong type of coal in the wrong hatch on that ship. That ship can refuse that cargo because it's contaminated. It's no secret working with coal is hard, dirty work. The main enemy of the terminal is wind. To control coal dust, the piles are watered by a sophisticated dust suppression system. And that'll be the thing that'll shut us down more than ice or snow or heavy rain. The winds today are calm. The dust system is working. In fact, with two ships in port, the terminal is running perfectly. They may be on track to break their single day loading record. The challenge today is to try to keep all the equipment running. The ship at berth two is taking 66,000 tons, and this is taking 142,000. We've got three vessels waiting out at anchor behind her, so we've got to get it loaded as quickly as possible so we can uh, get the next one in behind. Right now, we're in the process of loading number four hatch. Ship loader one. Go ahead. How much more do you have to go in that corner? 485. The ship loader is tied to the coal piles by another conveyor system. The operator must direct the coal into every corner of the ship's hold to maximize the load. But it's a process that must be done carefully. You can't just put everything at the forward end or the after end or even in the middle. It has to be distributed evenly to maintain the, the good order of the ship or it'll break. Literally break. Snap. I know it's hard to believe, but it will. As one of the holds fills up, the loader is moved forward on the ship. The machine can move 7,000 tons of coal an hour. Things are running perfectly. OK, thank you. But down in the yard, the process is slowing. One of the reclaimers is having a problem with its swinging arm, and it can only reach a fraction of the pile it should. So it's actually stopping before it, uh, it gets to its full swing, so we're not able to reclaim all the product from that pile. So we've got to get that fixed uh, as quickly as possible. To make things worse, one of the yard's main conveyor belts has just shut down. We're not having any luck at all there, right? The perfect day and that new record is now in serious trouble. They have to get back up and running fast. What was supposed to be a record-setting day at the coal terminal has just hit two serious snags. A main conveyor belt has just shut down, and the reclaimer that was scooping coal off the piles is acting up. The machine slews like this, and it's stopping about uh, five or eight degrees before it should. Leaving valuable coal out of its reach. A crew is off to fix the conveyor belt, and a bulldozer has been sent to help the reclaimer. We have two cats going out there right now to make sure we get the back of that pile pushed in so that we can make the tonnages for our layers. The problems won't affect the ship's departure this time, but it does cost the terminal that record. Little hiccup in dumper 31 here at the end of the day, but both ships will go out uh, sometime early tomorrow morning. Take the boredom. When everything's running just smooth and perfectly, everything's doing just wonderfully, then when it goes crazy, you gotta be able to pick it up and rock and roll. Traffic to Holland Dam, two miles west. Back downtown, the maritime controllers are guiding a fully loaded cruise ship into port. There's no reporting ship. They are sending her to a parking spot right next door to the container terminal. Holland Dam will end up on the west side of Canada Place. The Volan Dam has just returned from a West Coast cruise. It needs fuel, food, and fresh passengers. It all must happen in eight short hours. We are very quick uh, in offloading. Standing by on shore is an army. 
It's always busy on a cruise ship. We have a very limited time limit. Everybody's rush, rush, rush. Running the show is Barry Carlson and his team of longshoremen. The ship has to sail by five. The first job is to get the passengers and their bags off so the crews have room to work. As soon as all the lines are tight, then we'll be on the gangway, then our guys go on board, then they come down to this location, and then we start taking the baggage off. Within minutes of arrival, bags are pouring off the ship. The drivers pick it up, take it to the elevator, goes up to the uh, passengers. Once it gets going, everybody's just into the groove and away they go. 3,000 bags to come off in the morning, 3,000 more to go on in the afternoon. On board, staff start cleaning rooms immediately. Each cabin needs to be stripped down and made perfect in just minutes. In the laundry room, industrial machines will wash thousands of sheets and pillowcases. A folding machine, three floors below the main entertainment deck, presses and folds each sheet to perfection, ready to head out to another cabin. Back on the dock, trucks are arriving with supplies by the minute. There's a lot of stuff going on. Everything from toilet paper to tangerines. And I'll go around, check all the produce, give it a taste, um, smell all the produce and just check everything's legitimate. If it's not, then we send it back to our supplier and we get new stuff on board. The stakes are high. The executive chef double checks to ensure nothing is forgotten. You've got to be ultra careful. Yeah. Smallest, smallest one item. There you go. Oh, no bread. <laughs> Eight days, or ten days. No, you've got to be so careful. Every item's important, no matter what it is. That's good. That's good. Somebody said it's like a dance down here. Like one person moves in, the other one moves out, and, and they unload the truck, and it's a good a coordination effort between everybody then. But snipping out problems isn't only the job of the chef. Security on the ship is serious business. And before a pallet can be loaded, it must pass a sniff test. Are you ready to work? By these guys. Search it. Good girl. Over here. Search it. Up high. There you go. And she'll tell us if there's any explosive devices on this load. So up here. Good girl. This is all secure now. There's no explosive devices. So we're going down to do another six skids. While they prepare to start loading, below decks, the trash room is filling up as the staterooms are clean. Every bit of garbage must be hand sorted, pulling out anything that can be recycled. It's as important as anything else on the ship. The garbage has to come off. A week's worth of trash must be moved onto a barge that will take the garbage to a landfill. It could be 40, 50 tons of garbage. Switch it. Within an hour of arrival, the skids are inspected and the first loads are sent aboard. One gang is loading all the food, and liquor, and water, and whatnot. We load everything you can't eat in this area. Once on board, the food must be moved to refrigerators on the lower decks. On a good day, it's a hard job. Pretty fast. We do have till uh, 2 o'clock to have everything coming in and no going out. But today, the crew has just learned that one of the two elevators they use is broken. You're on the way. But right now, what happened is just like the elevator have got stuck. Try to figure out what's wrong with that. The captain knows that delays like this can mean a late departure. It's something he can't afford. 
Time is money, and uh, with the current fuel prices, uh, it's really important that we get out on time. Fixing that broken elevator is now the number one focus on the ship. The single working elevator is jammed to capacity, leaving staff and crew standing around. The Volan Dam has been in port since early morning. It's on a tight schedule and must leave within eight hours of its arrival or face a hefty overtime bill. An expensive delay that could put the entire crews behind schedule. The fact that one of the two critical service elevators has broken down has created a backlog on the ship and on the docks. A pair of crews have been scrambling to fix the elevator while the captain watches the clock. But by 1 p.m., the elevators are back online. They had a little problem. Uh, two bags of rice fell down the elevator shaft. They jammed the elevator, so they had to put guys down there at coffee time, clean it all out. But they got it going. They said it was going to take an hour. It took about 20 minutes, so. Very happy. I would say it's very happy, yeah, definitely. With the process back online, the crew keeps loading the supplies while the passengers start arriving at the terminal. Passport ready, please. That way, please. Your nationality. Below, bags are now flooding in. Keep her covered. And just like in an airport, each must be x-rayed. What you're seeing right now is a stockpile of luggage from 11.30 to 1 o'clock. On board the ship, it takes only a few minutes to fill the receiving room to overflowing with new bags. The elevator problem may be fixed, but it has put the ship behind, causing a backlog and a major headache in the bag room. Now less than an hour before departure, the second most powerful man on the ship is personally inspecting newly cleaned staterooms. Uh, beverage, glassware, uh, they have a standard uh, company setup and that everything is clean, organized. This is uh, doable with 15, 16 knots. On the bridge, the captain is briefing his crew on tonight's tides and route. And then about this area, we start uh, to slow down. Now we're just finishing up the luggage. We got a couple more cribs on the dock just to catch up on, and then basically we're just waiting. As they come in, we're loading their luggage. We'll just see in uh, 45 minutes if the ship sails, it's a perfect day. And what is your cabin number, sir? But in the terminal, that perfect day has just hit a speed bump. All of the passengers should be checked in by now, but there's a problem. We're still waiting for the bus Seattle shuttle with four people. If the tour bus doesn't show up in the next few minutes, the ship will set sail. Talk to me, Jay. You got some luggage coming at us? We do, Barry. Yes, we do. Barry has a plan. All we can do is go as fast as we can. His crew will inspect and hand carry all of the luggage directly onto the passenger deck, avoiding any long trips to conveyor belts three levels below. We'll load it on the ship trolleys, take up the ship and the off. By hand. By hand. <laughs> With just minutes to spare, the missing bus finally arrives. Here, here it comes out. Welcome aboard. The passengers make a mad dash for a vacation that almost sailed without them. Good afternoon, welcome on board. Welcome on board. Hello, welcome on board. Barry makes sure the bags make it. The life in the day of a cruise ship. The dock lines are pulled exactly on schedule and the Volan Dam sails again. As long as the ship sails at five, nothing else during the day matters. It's been a crazy few days at Vancouver's high-tech port. Wind, missing trains, broken equipment. Problems that were all solved quickly barely made a ripple. Everyone got in and out of port on time. Logs loaded on the river are now headed for Japan. The auto carrier left port three hours ago. That enormous coal carrier will leave at sunrise. By dark, the container ship has its load and is cranking up the speed to make its next city 
by morning. Running a big port requires big equipment and big ideas. Here, it pays to be industrious.